Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Purdue CIO Jerry McCartney and director of the Dawn or Doom conference. This is our fourth year of Dawn or Doom. Uh, each year bigger and better than the previous year. We're particularly happy this year to have participants from every college and to be partnering with the uh, Department of English's Big Read project, the Ecological Sciences and Engineering Symposium, an art exhibit from the Dublin Institute of Technology. It's over in Powell Hall. If you haven't been over there to take a look at that, please do. Cranet's Business Intelligence and Analytics Center Data Dive competition, which finishes tonight. And Design Good Now, which is sponsored by the Purdue Industrial, Ind Industrial Design and the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. You'll see each of these partners' events on our, on our schedule. Please feel free to drop by and visit them. Uh, they'll be delighted to see you. Anyway, you're very welcome to this year's Dawn or Doom event. This is the day two keynote presentation. Now, if you want to pick someone, um, pardon me, if you want to pick someone to talk about how science and technology are changing and will continue to change our lives, you couldn't go wrong with Nick Thompson, a veteran reporter, writer, and editor. He has written on technology and politics for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, Slate, Foreign Policy, the New Republic, the New York Observer, and other publications. He has appeared on Bloomberg TV, NBC, Fox News, MSNBC, ABC, NPR, CNN, and CBS. He revolutionized the New Yorker's online platform and transformed the magazine. Now, as the editor-in-chief of Wired, he's guiding a publication rooted in being at the forefront of digital innovation and in championing the role technology can play in making the world a better place. Nick is the author of the critically acclaimed biography, The Hawk and the Dove, Nietzsche Kennan and the History of the Cold War. He's received the 21st Century Leader Award from the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, is a Future Tense Fellow at the New American Foundation, and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He graduated from Stanford University, where he was a United States Truman Scholar. It's my great pleasure to introduce Nick Thompson. Thank you. Well, that was a kind introduction, and I'm uh, delighted to be here at Dawn or Doom and to be back at Purdue. Thinking back over that little uh, sketch of my journalism career, you know, the first profile I wrote um, when I was a very young journalist, just came to DC, was of a guy named Mitch Daniels. Um, <laughs> And so before going to see him this morning, I was like, you know, I ought to go read that thing and make sure it was nice. You know, liberal publication. But I couldn't find it on the internet, probably because I had built a website, because it was such a small publication, using an obscure technology called M4, and I couldn't find the darn thing. But apparently it was nice enough, and he welcomed me. So I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much. The talk I want to give for Dawn or Doom is partly about optimism. I am optimistic. Wired is fundamentally an optimistic publication. We do, and we have always thought Things are generally getting better. But that's a harder position to maintain right now. It's a little, technology is getting pretty complicated. And a lot of people who are very optimistic are a little less optimistic. And people who are less optimistic are now kind of on the fence. So what I want to do in this talk is try to spur some conversations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through 11 issues, 11 things where technology has built something really interesting, where there are positive effects, negative effects, and talk through them. So this is my starting point. This is partly why I took the job. I shifted, from, um, I shifted from The New Yorker. I left The New Yorker and was hired as the editor in Wired, and I started the same week as Trump. I've had a similarly smooth <laughs> tenure. <laughs> and one of the reasons I was so excited to take the job is the chance to weigh in. Right? So the fundamental thing that I believe about my job and the role of my job, and to the extent Wired can play a role in these conversations, is that there are things happening right now in the world of technology, and there are choices we are making. And sometimes we don't know we're making choices, and sometimes we don't know the implications of the choices. But the choices we make now will have profound effects on the way society functions, on the way our relationships work, on the way our economies work, the way our minds work, in a sense, even kind of what the human species is. 
right? We are at a moment where we get to make those choices, and it's hard because we don't know sometimes what those choices are. And so what I want to do here is to talk through a bunch of those things and also to keep this in mind. This is George Kennan, one of the protagonists in the book I wrote. And he said this, very, this thing that has stuck with me. If you change the lives of people so rapidly that the experiences of the Father, the wisdom of the Father, become irrelevant to the needs of the Son, then you've done something very dangerous. It's a gendered quote. Uh, you ideally would say fathers, daughters, mothers. But it's also really important because we are at that moment. We are. We are absolutely changing things faster. Kennan's advice would be to stop. You can't stop. So my advice, and what this talk will be about is, OK, accept this as the premise, and let's do the best we can as we change things. All right, so topic number one. This is one of the things that interests me the most. We have these phones, right? Incredible devices. Right? They're more powerful than supercomputers, I don't know, 15 years ago, right? They're built on these amazing chips that are you know, based on some of the work being done here at Purdue. They're amazing. They're incredible. And yet, for many of us, they don't actually make our lives better. We touch them something like, I think it's 2,617 times a day, I think is the average number, right? 80% of them, us, look at them within five minutes of waking up. And the reason for that is that what our phones have done is they're very good at sucking us in. They're very good, addicting is a strong word, but they're very good at addicting us. They're very good at taking our attention when our better selves know that our attention should be elsewhere. As Tristan Harris said in an interview with, I did with him not that long ago, the system is better at hijacking your instincts than you are at controlling them. And so what we need to do with our phones and our devices, it's partly personal. We partly need to recognize that these incredibly amazing devices that get better all the time, right? All the new phones coming out, right? The new Samsungs, the new Apples, they're just great. But we also need to recognize that behind them are the smartest engineers in the world. And they want your time. They want your attention. And they want your attention not to be on other things. Because that's the economic model. That's the business model, right? Reed Hastings once asked what Netflix competitor is. He said, sleep. Well, that's interesting. But it's kind of in your interest to sleep. It's pretty good to sleep. It's important for all kinds of human functions. So the first step is to recognize that the phones are designed to addict you, to suck you in, sometimes against your interests. This is one of the interesting design things I like to look at. So this is Twitter. And just look at some of the things that Twitter does to pull you in. Right? So it's got the continuous streaming thing that pulls you in. That's great. It's got trends for you, pulls you in. It exposes your number of followers to try to make you competitive, to try to pull you in, make you see, have there been new followers? Are there new followers? Do I have more followers than this other person? My favorite thing that Twitter does, and I think the most amazing design thing that Twitter does, and Instagram does the exact same thing, is that little notifications tab up there. It says 17. And what's so interesting about that is that when you load Twitter or Instagram, there's a delay. right? It could load exactly how many notifications you have, but it doesn't. It's mimicked, or it matches exactly the mechanisms of a slot machine, where it's the delayed gratification. And the reason for that is because, basically, that sort of triggers our mind. It pulls us in more. There's a slight delay, and then we get the serotonin. And now, it probably wasn't modeled after the design of slot machines. In fact, I'm quite certain. I've asked the founders of you know, Twitter and of Instagram. But it happened through sort of product testing, right? And you, they, at some point, at some moment, and nobody really knows when, they tested, showing you the number of notifications right when you open it, which probably helps with latency. It's probably good. And they tested delaying it. Turns out delaying it pulls you in more and gets more time, gets more engagement, gets more monthly active users, gets more daily active users, gets more time, gets more advertisements. And so that's what happened. So it's one of a thousand things. Snap streaks are another great example. That's a product design. Advantages of that. But it addicts you. It pulls you in. You have to keep your streaks going with your friends. That's a really complicated thing. And it's something we don't understand and have to understand. Here's some data. I don't know if you can read it, you probably can't. Um, but there's an app called Moment. You install it on your phone, and at the end of the week, it'll tell you, how much time did you spend in this app? How much time did you spend in that app? And then it will ask you, are you glad you spent that much time in it? <laughs> and so this is combining what the users say. So there are a bunch of apps, and everybody is glad about it. So Google Calendar, 99% satisfaction. I'm happy with Google. I want to spend time in it. I'm very happy. Evernote, high satisfaction, 96%. Uh, the weather. Right? Uh, ways. These are all things that people are very happy they spend their time in. On the other column, things they're not happy they spend their time in. Grinder, <laughs> Candy Crush Saga, and Facebook. Right? The most important app in the world, right? One of the five most valuable companies in the world. Also, in the places where people regret spending their time, Reddit, Tweetbot, which is a sort of a proxy for Twitter, Twin Tinder, Instagram, and Snapchat. So actually, the places where we're spending the most time, and look at the amount of time we're spending. So we're spending you know, three minutes in weather, 
I don't know, seven or 15 minutes in Waze, whatever that number is, I can't even read it. But we're spending, in Facebook, we're spending 59 minutes, and Instagram, we're spending 45 minutes, right? So the places where we're spending times are times where we're not satisfied. So that brings you back to the Tristan Harris thing, which is remember, our phones are better at addicting us. Our phones are better at hijacking our, our minds than we are at controlling them. And so that's important. So what do we do about this? I'm not sure. You know, part of it is self-control. But this is the one guy you can say this. I love this photograph. That's, uh, we did a Wired story about Apple's new campus, and we got to photograph the executives. And so we have this amazing photograph of Tim Cook. But the reason why Apple could solve this problem is that Apple is the only company that's not in the advertising business. Right? So the advertising business is what needs time, because it needs to sell your attention. Right? Apple's in the hardware business. Apple sells phones. So it needs to be happy with your phone. So actually, there's an engineer here from Apple. You could build a layer and build in people, allow people to sort of set controls over how they use their phones. And you could put that in the next iOS. You could put that in the next iPhone. So there is a way out of it. Half the phones in the world are, um, or not half the phones, you know, basically we have two phone operating systems, Apple and Google. Google can't change because it's built into its business model. Google actually, Android, the number of people with Android has just surpassed the number of people who believe in Christianity to talk about the scale of that operating system. But if there is going to be a solution, it's probably going to come from Apple. All right, so that's question one. A little bit of optimism at the end, since it is the optimistic technologist. And actually, I mean, I, I am going to guess sort of now I'm going to caveat the entire speech. I'm going to say a lot of critical things. I'm going to say a lot of things that are tough about technology. And it's all based on the fundamental belief that technology is a good, should be a good, should make our lives better. But it's something we have to think about the direction of, and we have to think about it carefully. That's the theme of the speech. So it's optimism, but optimism if we have conversations and if we think through this stuff. OK, question number two. What happens when artificial intelligence starts to regulate speech? This is, sounds, that sounds pretty wonky as I read it out loud. I'll tell you what the story's about. So I started the job uh, at Wired in January, and then, I don't know, maybe March or April, I got an email from Kevin Systrom saying, hey, you want to have coffee? Systrom is the CEO of Instagram. Every time I look at that picture, I think, you know, I'm not sure he, I ended up writing about him. I'm not sure he liked what I wrote about him, but he certainly liked the photograph, the art striver shot. It's very nice. Looks very handsome there. And my general philosophy is that if a billionaire asks you to coffee, you say yes. <laughs> so I go down, drive down to Menlo Park, meet with Kevin Systrom. I start talking to him. You know, what, is the, you know, what is the fundamental thing you're trying to do? How do you think about the power that Instagram has? How do you? And he says, well, we're trying to make Instagram nicer. What do you mean, make it nicer? It's a really interesting idea. And he goes on about all the different product launches they've had. And they've never really told the story about how they're trying to make Instagram nicer. They've never told it as a structured thing. First we did this, then we did this, then we did this. And they're trying to make people behave better, which is really interesting and also really complicated. And I'll get to some of the complexities about it. But anyway, so the way they started is they, you know, they first allow people to delete comments on Instagram. The sort of the cruelty on Instagram is not through the photographs, because you basically you control whatever photograph you put up of yourself, and they can't be reshared. There's like a structural difference with Twitter. So that allows you to have much more control over the entity you put on the internet. But the comments that come underneath, you don't have control over. Right? And that's where the cruelty comes in, where it says, Nick, you look fat. Nick, you look terrible. Nick, whatever. Um, and so the first thing they did is they allowed people to turn off comments. An interesting change. The second thing they did is they allowed people to algorithmically delete um, specific words or phrases or emojis. And they built this product. And the first time they tested it was on Miss um, Swift's account. She had gotten in a fight with Kim Kardashian, which was not a good idea. And in response, Kim Kardashian's fans had filled her feed with snakes. And one day, last July, people started to notice that all the snakes were disappearing. And why were the snakes disappearing? Turned out Instagram had rolled out this feature and beta tested it on Taylor Swift's account, which is hilarious. Like, you don't beta, for the coders here, you don't beta test on Taylor Swift. But <laughs> they did. So I love that. So they built that feature, and then they built another feature to help people who are possibly looking up information around cutting or suicide. That's another good feature. Then they built an AI system to filter out spam. And then they got to the stuff that's super interesting. So what they decided to do, and this is what most of my story was about, and I wrote about it for Wired and did a segment for CBS, was to try to use artificial intelligence to filter out cruelty, to basically look at language and say, that sentence is nice. That sentence is mean, or that is hate speech, or that is fat shaming. And that's a hard problem, right? Because language is hard. You can't just say we're going to ban specific words like, or emojis like that snake thing, because things are complicated. So this is just a random post from Kevin Systrom's in Instagram feed. And I'm just going to read some of the comments and talk about some of the complexities as you try to use filtering technology. So go to the window and take a big leap out of it. That's very mean. 
But every word in that is nice, actually. Window is a nice word. Leap can be a nice word, like leap of faith. Right? So it's a sentence where the specific words are nice, the sentiment is mean. Or, uh, let's go to the next one, meme lives matter. What does that mean, right? How can a machine know what that is? Well, that's a very specific context, and that's during a protest. This is in June of 2016. This is at a moment where meme lives matter is sort of a counter to the Black Lives Matter moment. It's right after Trump clinches the nomination. It's a lot of Trump's internet supporters. Is that mean? Is it not mean? Even as I explain it, you know, do I know? I don't know. You suck. That's mean. Um, <laughs> watermelon, watermelon. What the hell does that mean? Right? It could mean, let's go for a picnic, Kevin, right, if it's his mom. Um, but it doesn't mean that. It's actually a sexual imagery that is tied up with the Mean Lives Matter moment. So you have to learn that, right? You have to kind of be deep in Instagram to know that watermelon, watermelon is a bad thing. Uh, you can delete memes, but not cancer patients. I love meme, meme lives matter, all memes matter. Basically, the point I'm making is that words are complicated, right? Think about the word white, right? It can mean baseball, white socks. It can mean, if it's near the word snow, it can mean actual snow, which is white, or it can mean snow white and Cinderella. You can put it next to the word supremacy, and it's a very different word. So somehow, Instagram had to train machines to recognize this context and to do better at sorting through the comments than I just did. And so the way they did that is they hired about 50 people, they fed them thousands of comments, and they said, rank them. Say, this is hate speech, this is nice, this is fat shaming, this is cruel. And to rank all the comments, and then they took all those comments and all those ratings, and they ran them through an artificial intelligence system based, but built by Facebook, adopted by Instagram, and they tested, and they tested to see whether the AI filter would block out cruel sentences, and whether the AI filter would match what the humans had rated. And then they launched it. <laughs> And they launched it in June. This is the art we used in the Wired story, which I just think is hilarious. It's uh, the comments on the, you know, the character we had running through the issue and the comments on it. But so now Instagram's AI comment filter is live. And it is probably making Instagram nicer. But probably nobody here has noticed, right? Unless you read about it in Wired or saw a thing on CBS. But there's some really interesting implications from it. One of which is that our language and the things we say are being erased by machines without us knowing it, right? Because I type a mean comment, and the way Instagram has built it, I will see it, but nobody else will see it. So my speech is being deleted based on the choices made by those 50 people in a room, and then some algorithmic secret sauce that really nobody understands. So what does that mean, right? Is that good? Does that make Instagram better because it means the comments are kinder and it's a friendlier place and maybe makes it more open? Or is it a violation of one of the sacred principles upon which this country was founded? Does it make Instagram like Disneyland? Do we want to live in a world where all of our insults are knocked away? Because sometimes insults are helpful. So it's a really complicated thing. And it ties into one of the main issues in Silicon Valley right now, which is the evolution of views on free speech. So six or seven years ago, I mean, Silicon Valley comes out of the counterculture, right? It comes partly out of the free speech movement. The people who lead protests in the 60s helped start some of the proto-Silicon Valley companies. And you can see that DNA, and you can see that DNA being very powerful up until about five years ago. So this is, you know, 2009, the protests in Iran. There was a sense that technology is about providing free speech, and by doing that, you sort of get rid of despots. But the whole notion of free speech in Silicon Valley has completely changed since then. And in part, it's because people who talk about free speech are now political, different political ideology. Sometimes people who say, I want free speech, are just asking for the right to say racist things or to say racist things without being called a racist. And so now Silicon Valley's views on free speech have completely changed. So I asked Sistram about this. If we have a little video here. If we can play it from the back, that would be great. Well, hey. there's a age-old debate between free speech mm -hmm. and oh, like, what is the limit of free speech? And is it free speech to just be mean to someone? And I think if you look at the history of the law around free speech, et cetera, you'll find that generally there's a line where like, you don't want to cross because you're starting to be aggressive or be mean or, or racist. And you get to a point where you want to make sure that in a closed community that's trying to grow and thrive, you make sure that you actually optimize for overall free speech. So if I don't feel like I can be myself, if I don't feel like I can express myself, because if I do that, I will get attacked. That's not a community we want to create. So we just decided to be on the side of making sure that we optimized for speech that was expressive and felt like you had the freedom to be yourself. 
All right, overall free speech. Maybe that's good, maybe that's bad, but that is where we are going in Silicon Valley, and that is something that we need to think about. And where Silicon Valley goes on these platforms, I don't just mean it's where people in Silicon Valley are going. You know, there are 500 million people who use Instagram, so this is now the guiding philosophy of a thing that a huge part of the world uses a lot of time all day. So that's complicated, and that's interesting. There's some other implications, too. So one of which is, this is to get to the question I asked at the beginning, question number two. What if there are biases built into the system? What if what Instagram recognizes as cruelty is not what other people recognize as cruelty? So there was a researcher who studied, um, built an AI system to study restaurant reviews. And so he pulled the whole cor or a, a giant corpus of restaurant reviews and ran them through his filter, ranked the restaurants. The idea was, can you take all the words that people say about the restaurant and then determine whether it's a good restaurant? Saves you from having to type in thousands of things in Yelp or actually hire restaurant reviewers. And he started looking at it and he realized, wait, all the Mexican restaurants are doing badly. Why are the Mexican restaurants doing badly? Oh, we like Mexican food. Everybody likes Mexican food. Mexican restaurants are great. So he started to dig into the system, and it turned out it was because the word Mexican in the corpus of text he had analyzed was closely related to the word illegal and related to a bunch of other words. And so the machine was viewing the reviews of the Mexican restaurants and sort of analyzing them as though they were doing illegal things. And so they were pushing them down. But that wasn't apparent because it was just an AI built on a corpus of text and he was able to figure it out. But it raises a really interesting question. What if there are biases in the underlying text? What if there are biases in the underlying algorithms that we don't want? That's another really interesting question because we are about to enter an age where all kinds of things are decided by algorithms. So there's a um, corpus of photographs that is used by Microsoft and Facebook to train robots. People have been looking at that corpus of photographs and studying the AI results from it, and it turns out that, you know, after studying the photographs, the machines have decided that if there is a human in a kitchen, it is a female, right? And so you can imagine a robot trained on that system approaching a female in a kitchen and handing a mop and, like, handing the man a beer, even if the man is the one doing the dishes. Like, you can imagine all kinds of things that we don't want to happen. And that's a really interesting thing that we're going to have to think through and we're going to have to understand. We're going to have to understand how much we want to adjust these systems and how we want to deal with those biases. All right, question number three. What has the internet done to politics? Yeah, this is a complicated one. I could go the whole speech on this one, but I probably need to speed up since we only have an hour, and uh, let's talk about this for a minute. So I started thinking about this a lot during the Arab Spring, right? And there was a sense in the early days of the Arab Spring that technology was bringing people together and was bringing down dictatorships. It was doing just what we had wanted it to do, just what I had always wanted to do. You know, one of the reasons I was so interested in tech was this possibility. But this is a quote from Whale Gonim, who worked at Google and one of the, one of the organizers in Tahrir Square. It's a photograph of Tahrir Square. The same tool that united us to topple dictators eventually tore us apart. Now, this is not remotely to say that the Arab Spring failed because of Twitter. So that would be ridiculous. Like, there are thousands of factors, many vastly more powerful. But I do think there's something directional about what he says here, and that's interesting, which is that the internet is a great tool for building weak ties, for getting people together to organize a protest, right? Something terrible happens on the Purdue campus, I can send an outrage tweet, we can get there, we can like tear something down, we can get some administrator fired. But it's not as good at building strong ties, right? At really creating deep bonds between people, the kind of bonds you need to create a new government in Egypt, or that you need to rebuild a society, or perhaps even find the right administrator to replace the one we've just gotten fired. And so what the internet has done to politics is it has created a lot of change and a lot of energy. But I'm not sure it's created the right systems to rebuild it. And that's kind of a structural flaw and it's a complicated thing. Let's look at this country. So I think that maybe I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Twitter, Donald Trump. One of his digital directors just said we won because of Facebook. Now, there's, I'm not saying Trump shouldn't have won. I don't, you know, it's not, um, Wired's job isn't to get into politics. But what's interesting is that I, what I really fundamentally do believe is that the underlying algorithms have divided us. And they didn't necessarily elect Trump, but they allowed for candidates like Trump, very divisive candidates, candidates who create a lot of outrage, both from his supporters and from his opponents. And they've allowed candidates like that to thrive. And they've pushed us to extremes. The fundamental driving force of this is Facebook. Right? So Facebook, through its structural algorithms, has created filter bubbles, makes us listen to people who think like us. It encourages outrage 
the way the algorithm has been built from the very beginning is basically an outrage amplification machine, for better or for worse. And that has helped to create a system. There are lots of reasons, again, why Trump won. There are lots of reasons why Trump even rose as a candidate and why he defeated you know, people like Kasich, for example. Um, but I fundamentally believe that, that the internet has changed, has changed politics in this country. But so then there's this question. Could Facebook adjust its algorithm? And I know there are lots of people at Facebook working on just this thing. Right? So for example, it does not have to be the case that Facebook encourages outrage. Facebook encourages outrage because it fundamentally prioritizes shares and likes in a very short period of time after a post is published. And an out a post that says something like Donald Trump sucks or Donald Trump is the best will get lots of likes and shares in a very short period of time. But you could change that algorithm. You could change the way Facebook works. And you could instead prioritize the number of likes and shares that happen after somebody reads a story. Or as they've started doing the ratio of shares and likes after somebody has read to those before. And you can then kind of start getting proxies for the amount of information somebody has gained. You could change the algorithm so that somebody could opt in to block the filter bubble so they actually hear different viewpoints. There's a site on Reddit where, you're allowed to, where you can go in, you can say, change my mind on something. Type in the question you want your mind changed in on, people come in and answer it. You could build that into the Facebook algorithm and you could make politics better. And by better, I mean less divisive, less bifurcated. You could get this country a little more back to, to where it used to be. And that would probably be a good thing. But that is a real challenge. And that is something that young engineers should be thinking about and that people who watch these companies should be thinking about. You know, technology does not have to drive the country apart. In fact, technology could do the opposite. And that's one of the reasons why I'm optimistic that we can make it better. Hence my optimism there. Question four, when will the robots come? So one of the things, I just love this art. We use that in Wired for Story Wrote. So one of the expectations that we have is that, <laughs> this is an old New Yorker cartoon when I worked there. You know, there is this sense that robots are going to take our jobs and that robots are going to transform the economy. And so this is some, one of the things I was struggling with when I started, like, when is this going to happen? How much is this happening? And so we assigned a very smart writer to write a long essay about it. And he came to the conclusion, which is now a conclusion I've been convinced by, that actually, so far, so good. Right? Because if robots were coming and taking our jobs, you'd see a couple things. You would see increases in productivity. You'd see particularly increases in manufacturing productivity. And you'd probably see more job churn, people leaving one industry and going to another. But we don't see any of those things. We don't see increased productivity. We don't see increased manufacturing productivity. We don't see increased job churn. What seems to have been happening so far is that robots and AI have been enhancing things. Like, now there are lots of changes to manufacturing due mainly to competition with China and other factors. But they have not been because of robots. Robots have mostly been additive, right? So the best example so far I can think of, or an example used, is ATMs. ATMs came along. Everybody said, well, all the bank tellers are going to lose their jobs. Why would you go to a bank? Why would you need a teller? You can just put your card in a machine. Turns out the number of bank tellers employed has only been increasing. And the reason for that is that the ATMs kind of do the you know, foundational thing. They give out the money. And the bank tellers can do the more complicated things you set up in a state or whatever you do with your bank teller. And so the number of bank tellers has gone up. And so for the American economy so far, you know, mostly robots have been additive. And the question is, how long will that last? Will that always be the case? Will we always have like a synergistically beneficial relationship in agriculture in Indiana? Will we introduce, you know, I don't know, corn picking robots? There are all kinds of apple picking robots right now. Will that knock out some jobs but create better jobs? So far, that's what's been happening. We have no guarantee that that will keep happening. And we also have no guarantee that as robots develop more cognitive capacities, that humans will continue to be able to move into the more sophisticated tasks. But so far, so good, but also something to watch. So this is one where I'm optimistic about the present, I'm very curious about the future. Question five, how will the wars of the future be fought? So this is really complicated. So over the last 20 years, there have been a couple of technological innovations that have really helped the United States. You know, one of which is precision, another of which is autonomy. Right? And you know, there's an argument that the first Gulf War, one of the first things I remember seeing on television, the United States was so successful because we had access to GPS, and no one had had access to GPS in war fighting before, and we were able to get across the desert very efficiently. We were able to use precision bombing in a way that no other country could for quite a long time, and use autonomy to use drones. But what's so interesting now is that all this technology is available and is now available to people at a much smaller scale, including ISIS. This is ISIS testing a drone. And so we're about to enter a stage where the United States is still ahead of technology, but where some of the foundational things 
We don't have an infinite or absolute lead in it. And so it doesn't, I don't quite know where warfare goes from here. And there are all kinds of complications, right? The fact that you have autonomy and you have precision allows you to fight wars where fewer people die, which allows you to fight sort of longer wars because of the political change, and that's a complicated thing. But we're now entering a very complicated stage where the advantages the United States has had over the last 20 years, it no longer has to the same degree. And you can imagine things like autonomous suicide cars. That would be a real bastardization of one of the most exciting technologies in the world right now. Then there's also the question of hacking. So we sent a reporter to Ukraine to study the cyber war there. Really interesting stuff. So it goes to the Ukraine, the guy Andrew Greenberg spends a couple months there, or maybe a month there. And he learns all of what Russia has done to the Ukraine. He learns how they've tried to crash their financial system, they've manipulated elections, and they've knocked out the power grid on multiple occasions. Just knocked out the power grid by hacking into it. But what was so interesting that Andy learned was studying it and talking to experts and talking to people on the front lines. There's a sense that what Russia had done there was not just knock out Ukraine because they're having a fight with Ukraine, but was to prepare for a battle with the United States. And that was very clearly their intention, is to use Ukraine as a testing ground for that moment, at some point in the future. God hopes not that soon. But what have we seen recently? We've seen a lot of Russians hacking into the US power grid, maybe using the same, same techniques that they used in Ukraine. So we're about to enter a very complicated period of cyber war. But you can imagine all the implications if our power grid is knocked offline. So this is a, another complicated thing we need to think about, another complicated thing where we need to think about national strategy, where we need to think about cyber defenses. Probably something where we have not done enough thinking, though there has, of course, been a lot in recent years. Question six, what happens to privacy? So for the last 10 years in technology, there's been this trade-off, right? And we all know this trade-off, which is you know, basically on social media platforms, you are the product. And in exchange for better services, you give up personal data, right? That's the, that is the trade-off we have, particularly with Google and Facebook. You know, they will make their products better, and they'll make their services better for you if they can get more information about you, if they know where you are, if they know what device you're on, and they actually have more or less informa infinite information about us. And their business model is to take that information and to sell it to advertisers who can then target us. And it's a very effective advertising model, and it's a great business model because the products are free, they get better all the time, and all we're losing is our data. And for the most part, we've been totally fine with that. Right? We've been completely fine with this trade-off. We are happy to do it. You talk about privacy, people get outraged, but on almost no specific instance do we demand more privacy or ask that companies roll back their sort of continued intrusion into us. Um, I love this is another cartoon that ran in the, in the New York when I was there. But again, we're going to enter some interesting times, right? So we've had the Equifax breach, and we've suddenly realized the combination of all of our data being in relatively unprotected databases and lots of hackers, that's a problem, right? Because all our social security numbers are taken. We're about to enter a really interesting stage with face recognition. So again, Apple has presented this trade-off. Hold the iPhone 10 up to your face, unlocks it. Very efficient, right? Very efficient, possibly pretty secure if they've done it right. It's easier than sticking your thumb down. It's certainly easier than typing a password. You unlock your phone all the time. But then there's going to be a database of everyone's face. And that's really complicated. Apple, it won't be a problem, right? Or at least not for now. They only store the information locally. Apple, because of its business model, cares deeply about privacy. It will store the faces locally, so there won't be a centralized database. But as soon as Apple introduces this, every other phone's going to have it. You know, Samsung has it on a few. They'll have it on more. It's suddenly become quite common. And there will be centralized databases of all of our faces. And then think about what happens if somebody gets access to that or somebody wants to use it the wrong way. That's complicated. So again, another trade-off we have to think about. Another thing where technology has built something awesome. Apple's face recognition is awesome. It's so cool. You can't spoof it with a picture because it's using multidimensional imagery. Look at the number of places it's measuring. That is really great. That is wonderful stuff that they've built. And we have to think through what it all means. Question seven. So this, this is one where I just do not know the answer. So here we go. These are the five largest companies in 2006. Exxon, General Electric, Citigroup, Bank of America, Microsoft, and now Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. So we've entered a stage where the five big tech companies are the biggest companies more or less on Earth. And you can add you know, Alibaba and Tencent to that, um, Chinese companies. And they've all gotten to that position because they're really good. Right? They make great products. They innovate really well. They hire smart people. They do a good job. Right? Amazon you know, has made your textbooks way better here at Purdue. Right? That is a great delivery system. And it's really important, too, because students get charged way too much. Right? And you look at the amount that students pay for education over time, 
and it's outrageous the way it's gone up. And so the fact that Amazon has partnered with Purdue to make your textbooks cheaper is great, right? God bless them, right? Google provides access to all the world's information, and meanwhile, it's you know, built out the technology for self-driving cars. iPhones are great. But we've reached a stage where the amount of power these companies have is crazy. The amount of control they have is crazy. And we need to figure out what it is. So the law, you can't, under the way American antitrust law is currently set, you can't really do anything, right? Because antitrust law, basically since the 60s in this country, has been based on the principle that you can only use antitrust enforcement if a company is raising the prices too high, which you can't, certainly can't accuse Google and Facebook of because it's free, right? You can't accuse Amazon of because they undercut everybody, right? So you can't really use antitrust law to break them up. Maybe that's good. But what should you do? What should you do about this power, this concentration of power, this concentration of control over our information, control over our private information? What is the solution here? The thing that worries me most, the thing that worries me most about the consolidation of power, and mostly I love these companies, right? And I love the people who work there, you know, they're smart, they're dedicated, they, you know, they care about the right stuff. The thing that worries me most is the elimination of competition. And the specific example, so let's say somebody here at Purdue invents an app. I don't know, it's an app to assign seating at lectures or something, and it's great. And it starts to take off, and people start to use it, and it's a really good app. Or they build a new social network for connecting students. Apple, Facebook, and Google will know it's a success before that company does, because they will have all the underlying data of how everybody uses their phones. And so as soon as Apple, Facebook, or Google knows that there's this new thing, and people are adapting it, and maybe they're using it more than similar products that they've built, They'll just adjust their, pro their products and crush it. Or if they can't crush it, they'll buy it. Right? So suddenly, because of the control of the data, it becomes really hard to compete with them. And that's why you see so many startups who build something and then get bought, or build something and then are crushed by uh, you know, one of those big companies making a similar product. I mean, you're even seeing that with Snapchat, of all things. right? The one social network that's not controlled by Facebook that is actually growing has now started to stop growing because Instagram has copied all of its features. And so I worry a lot about competition, and I worry that the structure of Silicon Valley right now uh, limits competition. So I don't know what the solution is, but I think this is one of the most interesting questions. And I also think we're going to reach a moment where we're going to do something stupid, right? So much outrage is going to build up against Silicon Valley that we're going to have really bad antitrust regulation, or we're going to break up companies in ways they shouldn't be broken up. And suddenly we'll have the government mandating terms that are vastly worse and five years behind where the technology is. So this is something that I think about a lot and I'm worried about. So I guess there's not an optimistic technologist there. But Oh well, um, we'll get to full optimism at the end. Uh, question eight, what genetic engineering line should we not cross? Okay, let's switch into science for just a, just a minute. Uh, something wired covers something I'm interested in, right? So we have a new technology called CRISPR, right? CRISPR is great. You know, just this morning learning about some of the ways it can be used in plants, right? So what it does, it allows you, uh, your genome is basically the instruction manual for life. CRISPR allows you to go into the genome, allows you to adjust it, allows you to edit it, allows you to knock things out. That's great, right? You can make much better corn. Right? You can do all kinds of things. But it's also complicated. This is a scientist um, who's running an experiment on mice on Nantucket. The only way to conduct an experiment that could wipe an entire species from the Earth is with complete transparency. <laughs> so what he's doing is he's using CRISPR to basically make the mice in Nantucket immune to Lyme disease. And if you make mice immune to Lyme disease, then the ticks bite the mice and they don't spread the Lyme disease, and then they don't spread it to the humans. And that would be great, right? And as somebody who lives on the East Coast, I am all in favor of getting rid of Lyme disease. And I'm all in favor of experiments that get rid of Lyme disease. But this is where it starts. Because suddenly, with CRISPR, and with the technology called gene drives, you can sort of push that mutation into all the mice, and you can push it into all the mice in the world, and suddenly you've actually kind of fundamentally changed the structure of what a mouse is. And then what are the side effects of that, right? Because we're going to do this. We're going to do this because nobody wants Lyme disease. And you can't imagine somebody saying, stop this, right? Or you can't imagine, but it's not going to happen. Right? We're going to go forward, and we're going to do these experiments, and we're going to do them on mice, and then we're going to do them on humans. And it's going to be complicated because everything we do at the beginning will be great, but we will also be fundamentally changing nature. So we'll be building things that are amazing and will make our lives better in the short term, but complicated things happening in the long term. So what about when we start doing it to humans? Like, what if we find a way that we can use CRISPR to make humans just a little bit smarter, a little bit stronger, make babies a little bit taller? Certainly we'd do it if we could make babies immune to you know, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or something or know that they're not going to have that or certain forms of cancer. We'd 
would allow that. But what if there's something we can do that makes them a little bit stronger that costs $100,000, or that's only available to in certain countries? Then you've created real inequality issues. So you have an amazing technology. You have one of the most important and exciting things ever created by scientists. And we don't know what the lines are, and there aren't enough people thinking about those lines. So I love the technology. I love that this has been built. I love that it's going to make corn taste better. I worry a lot about what's going to happen when it gets to us. Question nine. So this is one of the things where my friends just fight all the time over this one. Climate change, huge issue, huge problem. You know, whether it's directly responsible or indirectly responsible for the extreme weather we've been having, we don't know. But it is clear that you know, humans are contributing to climate change. Climate change creates massive risks. Maybe it will create some positive effects. But for a large part, it will probably create negative to catastrophic effects. So how do we limit it? You could try to do what we've done the last 20 years, which is you can try to say, hey, recycle, use solar power. And there are people like Elon Musk who've built amazing things using solar power. We will probably shift to electric cars, perhaps solar-powered electric cars. The economy is changing in ways that are incredible. That's not going to do it. Right? That's not enough. We have tried reduce, reuse, recycle. So I think we're almost at the moment where we have to try to use science to reverse it, right? where we have to use different technologies to shoot sulfur up into the atmosphere, right? attach a tube to a boat, put it out there, put a balloon on top, shoot sulfur up there. It'll be like Mount Pinatubo. You need to reflect the sunlight back up, giant reflecting mirrors, try to develop some kind of massive carbon sink, change the way the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide. We're going to have to use science to reverse this, I think. You know, it's kind of at a point where, you know, a patient comes in and the doctor for 10 years is like, you need to eat better, you need to eat better, you need to eat better. And then it's like, okay, now you need to do surgery. But the problem is, once you start to talk about this, it makes people worried. And it actually makes a lot of people who are advocates for sensible climate change policy worry because they think as soon as you start saying, oh, the engineers will be able to solve it, then people will stop doing all the other things. They won't buy electric cars or put solar panels on their house. And so that gets really complicated. So even proceeding with this kind of science is fraught. And a lot of people who work on it, our colleagues, are not excited about it. And we had a vicious debate at The New Yorker between one of the, you know, a writer who was writing about geoengineering and another writer who, a great climate change expert, who was like, no, no, what are you doing? Stop talking about that. This is one of the most interesting things. I am firmly on the side of geoengineering. I'm firmly on the side that we need to use science to try to reverse the effects of climate change or at least set up some sort of defense mechanisms if things start to spin out of control. Um, I am all for that, but this is complicated and interesting. All right, question 10. Kind of near the end here, so I will remind you at this point that after I finish blabbing, we will have a moment for questions. But this is one of the, this is definitely the farthest out on a limb I'm going to go. So does AI need an off switch? So people have been hearing, this is an idea. Worth reading Superintelligence by Nicholas Bostrom. We need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. So a guy named Elon Musk is pretty smart. So, what he's talking about when he talks about um, Bostrom is a thought experiment that this philosopher Nicholas Bostrom ran. And the notion is we are building machines that are much more intelligent than us. And we are about to create a moment where we not only create machines that are more intelligent than us in every way, but those machines will invent the next group of machines. Right? And so then those next machines that have been invented will create the next one. And suddenly they'll start speeding ahead. Right? And so then like six months of improvements in machine intelligence will be like 500,000 years in human improvements in intelligence. And not only that, we humans, we get smarter, we teach things, we have students, we learn things, and then we die, and our kids are maybe a little smarter, and they have some corpus information. The machines just get smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. So maybe we'll be able to harness all that and use it, and humans will continue to be the dominant species on Earth with just extremely helpful machines. Maybe there'll be some peaceful existence where evolution kind of proceeds. And for a period, a small blip in the history of the Earth, humans were the most intelligent species on Earth. And then we created our successor. And there's some other species, whatever the heck that means. But then you can also imagine something going wrong. And so the thought experiment that Bostrom runs, and that Musk repeats, Bostrom uses with paper clips, but I prefer Musk's example, which was with strawberries. Imagine you had the smartest machine in the world, smartest machine in the world, and you said to it, and you programmed it with one instruction. Maximize the number of strawberries on Earth. OK. First thing it would do is it would be very smart about where you should plant strawberries. Right? Study soil science, study genetic engineering. Maybe it would make big strawberries. Right? Best machine on Earth can probably do that, way beyond human intelligence. That's fine. That's good. 
But if that's its only instruction to make the maximum number of strawberries, what's the next thing it does? Well, I don't know. But maybe it crashes the stock exchanges and where blackberries are traded. Or maybe it decides that actually some of the best strawberry fields are set up as baseball diamonds, and so somehow it destroys the economy for little leagues, right? And you can imagine if it has this superintelligence that's hundreds of thousands of years where, above where human intelligence is, it can start doing that, and it can start manipulating the economy. It doesn't know where to stop, because it's just got that instruction to make as many strawberries as possible. And then ultimately decides to you know, bulldoze the Purdue campus, because actually strawberries would grow really well here, and that's its only goal. And it's so much smarter <laughs> than the humans that you can't really stand in front of the bulldozers. And the bulldozers, the yeah, bulldozers just bulldoze this whole place, and suddenly we're strawberry fields. That's not going to happen. I'm very confident that Purdue will not be bulldozed for strawberry fields. <laughs> I'm going to stick by that. But I, it's an interesting thought experiment, because it's not strawberries. But you can imagine a machine vastly more intelligent than us that can do this. So the question Musk asks is, should we have an off switch? Right? And other people have asked that. And the off switch is something where, like, as the you know, Purdue pulping strawberry AI tractors start to rev up, you can turn it off. I mean, Musk has been asked, if there is an off switch, would you like to control it? And he's like, no, because I'd be the first person who'd get killed by the machine. Um, but that's a big question in AI, is how do you, as we move forward and as we build those super intelligent systems, how do we control for the worst case scenario? Like, what is our scenario planning? How do we do this? So that's a really important thing to think about. And it's a thing where you can be deeply optimistic about AI, deeply optimistic about the potential, the problems that can be solved. I think self-driving cars are one of the greatest improvements in my lifetime, because I think people won't crash. Your cars are the most unsafe thing. I have kids who are 9, 7, and 3. Like, I am thrilled that when they go to college, ideally their drunk friends won't be driving them, right? Like, that is a massive improvement in life. I'm all for that. But this is complicated. What are we going to do with AI? All right, number 11. <laughs> Sorry, I've raised all these sort of dystopic things, and, and here's the optimistic speaker. And the answer is we should not. Like, in general, we should remember the principle that you know, humans continue to adapt with technology. Things do continue to get better. We do harness it. Like with the robots, things go well. And then also, we should keep in mind this slide, which you can use with almost any new technology. This is from a cartoonist XKCD. So I don't know. Let's use AI. Will AI make us all geniuses? No. Will AI make us all morons? No. Will AI destroy whole industries? Yes. Will AI make us more empathetic? No. Will AI make us less caring? No. Will teens use AI for sex? Yes. Were they going to have sex anyway? Yes. Will AI destroy music? No. Will AI destroy art? No. But can't we go back to a time? No. Will AI bring about world peace? No. Will AI cause widespread alienation by creating a world of empty experiences? We're already alienated. Anyway, you can plug any technology into that grid and get the right answer. So fundamentally, I am optimistic, but I do believe we need to answer these questions. Uh, I'm now at the end. This is where I say, this is what we do at Wired. We try to think through these questions. We run essays on these questions. Please subscribe, <laughs> www.wired.com slash subscribe. Uh, read all about it. We're... And there we are. So now I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has in the audience, um, and we'll roll from there. And thank you very much for, uh, for having me here. What time is it? No. Shockingly ended right on time. Hello. Yes, hi. It was awesome to have you here. Thank you. And with all of these new technologies, the one striking thing is in the next 15 to 20 years, all of this genetic engineering AI will be super beneficial. And this is where you know, a lot of the economic gains will be. But then in the long term, there are certain risks that we can't really foresee and unintended consequences. So then at this point, should we you know, sort of take a step back and think about those consequences? Or should we just say, you know, fuck it, we'll just think about it later? Because, because with these technologies, whoever has the best technology controls the technology. So what we're almost certain to do is to say fuck it and just move forward. What I think we should do is we, I don't think we should stop, right? There is no stopping. We are moving headlong into this. There is no way that we're going to stop any of these technologies. The capitalism won't allow it. Our human nature won't allow it. But what I do hope happens is that the people who are making these decisions, and this is why, 
you know, why college is so important, right? Why it's so important that people who study engineering also study philosophy, right? And that people actually start to have the understanding to think through these big questions as they move into positions of power. And as, you know, we train the next generation of people who will work on CRISPR and work on genetic engineering, that they've thought about this and that they have backgrounds and that the companies hire people who study philosophy and who make moral decisions, right? So we just put an article on Wired about one of the specific examples, right, which is a self-driving car. It's going to have code that tells it what to do when it reaches a situation where, you know, there's a dog crossing the street and it could swerve left, and if it swerved left, it would hit two pedestrians, or if it swerves right, it would go over the bridge and kill the driver, right? So what do you want it to do? Like, how do you make that decision? And that's a complicated moral decision, but it's like those moral decisions will be embedded in the code, and they'll be embedded in the code in self-driving cars in a way that's easy to see, and they'll be embedded in code in other systems that are harder to see. So how do we make those decisions? And so companies, the big technology companies, are starting to think more and more this way, um, but that is something very important that we will need to do. Of your two choices, we definitely need to do number one. Don't stop, but maybe not, not even slow down. Don't stop, don't slow down. But think as you go, um, and we'll see if that happens. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yes. <laughs> do you think it's up to the government to create re legislation that will control the company's kind of setup of their technology, or do you think it's up to the companies themselves to help figure out what these moral decisions are going to be? Oh, man, that's such a good question. So I think the government should probably, the government moves very slowly and has a poor understanding of technology. I would rather the government had a better understanding of technology and we elected more people with deeper understandings in technology. I wish the technology industry wasn't so focused and concentrated in Silicon Valley and Boston and Washington because it has no political influence, right? It has six senators who are, care what it thinks. Um, so I wish politicians were better. I want politicians to be way better at making these decisions, and I want them to make not a lot of decisions. Um, because I think it is fundamentally going to be the companies that are able to understand their technology and make the right choices. So I think it's our job as citizens to put pressure on the companies or as engineers to help change the way the companies work. Um, and then also government to legislate but not you know, too deeply in a way that just messes up. I mean, technology is the best growing industry in America, and we could easily screw that all up. So we have to be careful there. Uh, and on the side? Yeah, so I, I've read a lot about, like, how Mark Zuckerberg has done his best to, like, distance himself from um, kind of feeling any moral obligation to uh, get involved in, like, what happened in the 2016 election, election and, like, basically saying that Facebook didn't have a part in um, swaying people's votes, but, like, I, I feel like that's not true. Um, so how do we get these companies to care and, and, you know, kind of take ownership for their own platforms? And, you know, obviously, Facebook is an important platform. It needs to exist. Um, how do we get them to, you know, get rid of these echo chambers that exist and get them to, you know, take action? That was a great question. I was just editing, right before I came, we were editing a story that we're, you know, trying to grapple with that. So I think at Facebook, I kind of feel like the problem is just Zuckerberg, right? Like the weird thing about Facebook is that it's run a little bit like a dictatorship or a little bit like a cult, um, and that Zuckerberg has this slightly delusional belief that if there's a problem in the world, the way to solve it is to have more Facebook, right? Like, <laughs> actually, actually, the problem with politics is that not enough people spend enough time on Facebook, right? And that. You know, filter bubbles aren't really a problem in Facebook. Actually, Facebook makes filter bubbles better, and Facebook got all these people to vote. Um, but that one level below Zuckerberg, there are a bunch of people who actually really understand at a deep level what has happened. And so the question for Facebook is partly like getting Zuckerberg to realize, partly to empower the people who have a sort of deeper sense, um, and also to help propose solutions that allow Facebook to fix its problems without you know, messing up its business model, because if something messes up its business model, it won't do it. But I do think this, is one of the, I think this is one of the fundamental questions in American democracy, is how the Facebook algorithm works and how the you know, Facebook machine works, and can you change it? And to me, the Russian ad buy, which is all in the news right now, is a pretty small thing. Maybe we'll learn more that it was a big deal, but it's a tiny amount of money. It's a small amount of what was spent. And you know, Trump did use um, micro-targeting to target specific groups and maybe to suppress the vote in places, but so what? I mean, Hillary did the same thing, and that's kind of like a natural thing that we knew would happen. The real problem is the sense that Facebook creates the filter bubbles and the echo, echo chambers and the outrage. Um, and so that's the thing I wish that 
which they would try to change. So the way we do it is we, you know, we try to use these products differently. We talk about these products. We put pressure on them. And I don't know. We hope Zuckerberg kind of uh, has, a, has a moment where he switches his view and is able to see, I mean, is, is, and comes to see Facebook the way I see Facebook. I mean, seems pretty pretentious and ridiculous. But like, then his position changes. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Over here. I was listening to your apocalyptic uh, scenarios for the future where <laughs> <laughs> the machines take over and kill us all. And uh, I did not worry too much, even before you said we should not freak out. But because <laughs> I was thinking, machines, however clever they are, they are simply repeating what we taught them. And I thought our creativity is our savior, our, our weapon against uh, this scenario of developing where the machines take over. Uh, I mean, a machine today cannot invent a process to make the silicon chips smaller than they are. You still need a human. You still need a thinking process. And this is, but the question is, are there any signs that uh, this might happen, that the machines can actually start creating on their own? Not, not we told them, not neural networks and, yeah. and, and la layers, of, but really creative process. I think they are. I mean, I think that we are going to reach the point where, I mean, that is the, you know, that is the big difference, right? We are more creative than machines are. Like, a simple way to look at it is like calculators brute force. I mean, machines are kind of like that, whereas we actually tell them what to do. I think we are going to reach a point where machines have creativity and can get closer. And not only that, where they do things, but where their human inventors don't know why they did it. Right? I think that, you know, go back to like in a very simple example, like Instagram's AI is far from the world's most sophisticated AI. But there are things that that system filters out that they don't know why it filtered out. And there are things it learns as it studies this, and we don't know why it learns and advances. And in a way, that's, you know, we've told it what to do, and we've set the guiding principles. But in another way, it's evolving on its own. So I think we are going to see a lot more evolution. But this is why, most likely, you and I will not die at the hands of a strawberry bulldozer. But <laughs> some of the other people in this room, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, another question here on the left. OK. Um, uh, I wanted to pick up on something you said about uh, how these big companies, Apple, Facebook, Google, are more powerful than companies have ever been. Full disclosure, I work for Google. But, you know. I also said I love Google, didn't I? Yes. Well, I do too. And, and Wired. Mm -hmm, thank so, you. But moving right along, um, <laughs> as a student of post-war America, you know about United Fruit in Central America. You know about IT&T and its role in toppling Allende in Chile. You know about U.S. oil companies toppling Mossadegh when he started to nationalize oil, and let alone the role of railroads in 19th century U.S. immigration. You know, they've mm -hmm. steered the politics of this country for ages. I wonder if there isn't something different in as much as these may not be more powerful, but they're kind of transnational. Mm -hmm. The people, you know, the, the sources of their power are their global networks, and they're headed by people who frequently have slightly libertarian bents mm -hmm. that say, like, let's just evolve beyond politics. Is that kind of the, the, the lack of dependence on the nation state creating the problem? Mm -hmm. That's a super interesting question, right? So part of that is why do I worry less about Google than I would have worried about a similar company with a similar amount of power in 1960? So part of it is the specific people who run Google who you know, as it happens, are basically good-hearted people, right? You know them, and they're not power-hungry, and their incentives are, you know, the thing that fundamentally drives the people who make the most important decisions at Google is, you know, organizing the world's information and, as they understand it, making the world a better place, right? So that's one difference. Second difference is that Google's business model, I maybe shouldn't just talk about Google, but we'll talk about all these companies. Google's business model, and also Facebook's, more or less the way they make money is not by like crushing all the other banana companies and crushing the strawberry companies and growing more bananas, the way they make more money is getting more people to use the internet, right? And so fundamentally, the thing that makes them more money, which will have provide a gravitational force on them no matter what, is basically a good thing, right? The thing that makes you know, Google more profitable is more people using the internet in more ways. And so that has meant that the policies Google has pushed since early days have been more or less for an open internet, you know, providing fiber optic lines to people, getting more people online, you know, introducing a thing called AMP so that mobile websites you know, like load faster. Right? So more or less, Google has been about improving the internet and making it available to more people, because that's where its business is. So those are a couple reasons why I like, worry less about Google than I would have worried about United Fruit. 
probably if I'd been giving a speech here about United Fruit and Monopoly Power, I would have been like telling you to, you know, burn it down. Um, so that's part of it. Also, the transnational interests, I think, are part of it. But then, you know, you've got all those things on one side. Here are the reasons why Google won't be evil. And then you've got its power and its capacity to be evil. And its capacity to, or even not be evil, but to act in its interest and to cross competition, which again is the thing I said I worry about the most, right? Google knocking off all possible comp competitors to us. So, you know, basically, I'm very positive on these companies. I'm very positive on the way they operate. Or the possibility that Google ultimately is not run by people who have those interests, but is replaced by a group of other people, right? Eric Schmidt used to talk about, you know, he said, well, we tried to set it up so that even if one day you replaced me and Sergey and Larry with the most evil people on earth, the structures would prevent them from doing evil things. I don't know if Google has done that. So there is a possibility that Google's, Google changes, Facebook changes, and ends up having more evil. And there's the possibility that the, you know, as what happened with Facebook, right? I think that what Facebook did to American politics is one of the darkest things that has happened uh, in this country. And the consequences of it are severe, right? And if you're a Trump supporter, they may be extremely positive. If you're a Trump critic, they may be extremely negative. But I think the creation of this kind of politics to the extent that Facebook played a role in it is an example of a company with loads of power you know, eliminating, you know, not intentionally, sort of unintentionally, a sort of a, countervailing, a counterbalancing news ecosystem and having a huge impact on something that has been deeply consequential. So that's kind of an algorithm running away issue. Anyway, so I sort of agree with your premise um, that there are a bunch of factors keeping them in check. I add a couple other things and then I do still worry. I sort of had a half answer to a really good complicated question. <laughs> Yours? Hi. My name is Abby. I'm a senior here studying engineering and international relations. Great. So I'm very interested. A lot of the ethical issues that you mentioned you want to see our society wrestle through, privacy, free speech, climate change. Um, can you talk about those in an international context? So there right. are a lot of regimes that don't necessarily value those and probably won't have societal conversations about mm -hmm. those types of issues. So how does America balance our need to maintain technological offset and technological advantages on the world stage versus our need to slow down and consider these issues? And what institutions do you see making some of those decisions? Oh, that's a great question. That's also like an implicit really good critique of my talk, which is my talk is a little US nationalistic focus, particularly that you know, warfare slide. Um, so the answer is one of the great things about tech is it does allow for, in a way that wasn't possible, for communications across language, across cultures, across boundaries. So there is a possibility for a certain kind of organizing. There certainly is much greater information spread, so we create something that can limit CO2 emissions. It can spread to other countries much more quickly through scientific exchanges. One has to hope that you know, the sort of increasing nationalism in American politics, the sort of limitations of immigration, like that doesn't slow down the free exchange of ideas. So I suppose I would argue that one of the great things of tech is that it does massively enable um, kind of cooperative international problem solving. The difficulty is that we do not, as you asked at the end of your question, we do not have an international organization or a mechanism to solve these problems, right? We have basically created a number of good-hearted but toothless and effective um, international organizations. And so you've got to hope that one of the things that tech can do, and maybe the big tech companies can do, is to help create international, right? Yeah, here we go. This is what you should do for a living when you graduate. You should use your knowledge of engineering and your knowledge of international politics to create some sort of tech-focused international policy-making decision group that goes way beyond like ICANN or something like that, and that helps the world make the right decisions about directions that technology should go, because it is like a human challenge. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I had a great time. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Purdue, for inviting me. Uh, I'll catch you later.